Pundata. So we're going to give you some practical advice for getting started for those who are curious about uh, making your data more open and sharing your data openly. Um, so we have one hour scheduled for today's webinar and we have two fantastic speakers. So Dr. James Green from University of Limerick and Dr. G.J. Peters from the Open University in the Netherlands. So they're going to talk, I believe the focus is going to be kind of a conversational um, slash discussion between the two, of, the two of them and then we can open up uh, for questions as we go. Um, and so, as I just mentioned, so I will be recording um, today's webinar. So if you don't want to appear in the recording, maybe just knock your camera off. Um, and the recording then will appear on our YouTube channel, um, as well as the EHPS uh, website. So just give you a heads up about that. Um, and then in terms of questions, so we can take questions um, as they come in. So if you have a question over the course of the next hour or so, then uh, it would be great if you could just pop up your hand um, in Zoom. Um, and also maybe if you would rather uh, leave a comment, you can leave a comment into the chat um, and have me read it out for you if you prefer that. Um, and then in terms of just optimizing um, how the, your visual experience of the next hour. Um, so GJ is sharing his screen right now. Um, and then James will be coming in as well, um, of course, at certain points. Um, but GJ will share his screen throughout. So to make sure that you can still see the shared screen um, throughout, um, what I would suggest is to go into the list of participants in Zoom, um, and then where you see GJ's name up the top, um, hover the mouse over his uh, name, and you'll see three dots, um, and then click those three dots, and then just select pin. Um, and I can put this information into the chat as well, um, in case um, anyone gets stuck there. Um, but that will help you see GJ's screen um, continuously. Um, we also, as well, um, have a newsletter um, from our EHPS um, Open Science Special Interest Group, which I'll put into the chat now. Uh, and so we do run webinars um, about every four to six months um, as our with our SIG. So I put the um, the link for our newsletter into the chat now, so you can sign up to our newsletter um, and stay updated uh, for when we uh, run our next webinar. Um, and of course, I will also introduce the fact that this is a collaboration with the EHPS uh, Create, um, and they just mentioned the upcoming uh, Create workshop. Um, which is taking place at the before the EHPS conference later this year. So, Namaya, do you want to come in and say a couple of words um, just from your side on on Create? If we have Maya. Yeah, sorry, I was gone for a second, but I'm back because I didn't Yeah, um, I think Alia already just said something about the workshop. Okay. So, Create is. Uh, yeah, just the early career division of the EHPF, and you can find all our info on the website, which we will also put in the chat. So you can join our join, uh, mailing list or follow us anywhere on social, on all the social media, which are all also on the website. So I'll link them there. Um, yeah, um, I think the web workshop has already been plugged, so I'm not going to really plug it. But I'll also put the applications that are already op uh, open tomorrow, I think in the chat as well. Brilliant, thanks so much, Maya. Um, okay, um, just lastly, I'll just mention that at the end, um, I will distribute a feedback form, and that is a chance for you to uh, let us know what you want to see from us in terms of future webinars. So I'd be very grateful if you could take a moment when I put that into the chat at the end of the meeting to briefly fill out uh, that evaluation form. Uh, so without further ado, I will throw things over to GJ um, and James. Um, so over to you guys. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll briefly kick it off because I moved to the slides. So um, the slides will be uh, after the, at that link. It will also be shown at the end. And Rory, you can probably send it around to people as well. Um, and then James will tell me when to move to the next slide after the first slide and the second one. Fast. The unmuting curse strikes again. Um, so thanks and for coming along. So we're going to hopefully talk to you through a little bit about getting started and some practical advice and some examples uh, about working and start getting started out with opening data. Uh, so we'll cover off a little bit about privacy and property, particularly about who owns or does not own data. Uh, talking about how you then go about licensing that. Uh, we'll cover off fair data, talking about how do you make it open uh, the interoperability side of it, sharing identifiable data, um, and we're super keen for 
if you've got any questions along the way. So either at the end or now, feel free to um, ask us some questions. So why open data? So I spend some time trying to convince my colleagues that open data is a good idea. Uh, and so one of the things which I think is a really strong selling point is so obviously there's like great advantages for transparency in science, but it's also actually selfishly beneficial as well. Um, the longer you spend in science, the further back you'll go and you'll open up some old files from an old project and you'll like wonder what the variables were or how you uh, created them. Uh, so I have this quote here, um, your closest collaborator is you six months ago, but you don't reply to emails. Um, and so people think at the time that they'll remember what they did or what's contained in a variable, and it turns out that's not true. And once you get into a supervision role, then your students, or sometimes you get data from your students, and then you look at it and you're like, I can't make any sense of this. So I think if you go through and start out with these kind of like open data principles in terms of trying to like accurately describe and be really clear about what you're doing with your data set, then it actually makes it really useful kind of like at an internal level as well. Um, it's obviously really good um, for transparency and science. Um, and it also enables you to make use of others' data, which can be great. I don't know if everybody can read uh, the cartoon here, but it's talking about the reuse of somebody else's code um, and just how bad that's going to be. Um, yeah, I can't quite read it myself, actually. But yeah, anyway, basically, it suggests that they were going to try and reuse it, but then it turned out to be indecipherable. Was that a subtle wink? It was a subtle wink. <laughs> Um, so making use of others' data could be as simple as doing a power analysis. So if you're going to do like a sort of a power analysis properly, then one of the ideas is that you should actually know something about the variability. And so in that case, often like the mean or the standard deviation of the data that you're expecting. Um, I mean, a lot of the time people are just like, oh, I'm going to get a medium effect size. But if you actually want to do something more serious, then you actually need to know like what are the means, what kind of like change you're expecting um, to try and do that. So that's one thing you can use other people's data for just to like get an idea about what the variability of the data is going to do. Um, also useful for simulations. And I think it's probably been somewhat uncommon in psychology, but I'm definitely seeing more PhDs and I guess health psychology as well, seeing more PhDs coming through where people are actually making really extensive use of secondary data. So they're not necessarily actually going out and collecting their own data, um, but actually making use of other big existing studies to answer questions with other data sets. Um, and there are some big kind of examples of this. So for example, the European Social Survey uh, happens every few years, and that's a really big open data set. Um, there's a lot of national and international data archives. So being based in Ireland, the one I'm the most familiar with would be the Irish Social Sciences Data Archive. So for example, there they've got the Growing Up in Ireland data set, which has some really fantastically rich information, amazing sampling of like 6,000 uh, young people who are followed up every like five or six years over time. And so you can apply to get access for that. Um, and that's a great resource, and I've seen people use that for entire studies and their PhDs. And we'll cover a little bit about the kind of like the more sensitive data later. But if you have questions which can only be answered with the like the much more sensitive data, then you're actually able to apply for like a deeper level of access um, where you can actually, you know, get information at a level where people would be potentially uh, identifiable or um, maybe more sensitive sensitive variables about like whether people have mental health problems or whether they've been experiencing bullies. So there are kind of like different layers of kind of going through that. Um, and they would have like really good processes in place around how you go about accessing that data. Um, and then it's also possible just to go and find data sets on things like the Open Science Framework or Zenodo or other kind of institutional repositories. Um, or also sometimes in journals. Right, I'll hand over to GJ now. Sorry, I was too fast. Um, so when it's when you have discussions about open data, quite often, um, often institutions worry about uh, who owns the data because the reflex of a lot of institutions is that data they collect belongs to them. Um, 
fortunately, that's solved by the GDPR, because data that are, are by the GDPR and by intellectual property law, um, the GDPR is very clear about the fact that personal data are owned by that person. That's why the GDPR makes this such a hassle in the experience of a lot of people. Um, if you process personal data from your participants, you're only allowed to do this temporarily. So you always have to communicate to them in advance for how long you're going to process the data and what exactly you're going to do with it because you're kind of like loaning their data or renting or whatever. Um, personal data is not data like the, the default demographic data that we know. It's not like age is always personal data or gender is always personal data. Personal data are data that are about a person. So that means any data point can be personal data and any data point can also not be personal data. Some are, I mean, like, uh, I don't know, your social security number is personal data. So some data points are always personal data, but for most data points that we work with, whether they are personal data or not, depends on whether they are linked in a data set in a way that makes persons identifiable. Um, often you want to pseudon pseudonymize uh, data by, for example, collecting personal data and then having a second data set that strips off some columns that make it identifiable. And then the second data set in its, on its own doesn't contain any identifiable data anymore. So arguably wouldn't contain uh, personal data. The GDPR says, however, as long as it's pseudonymized, so you have a secondary data set that allows you to still identify the original data set, you should treat it as if it was personal data, which is a bit of a hassle. So that means that if you uh, have a system where you have two surveys, for example, you collect your data in one survey and the second survey is only used to check whether somebody completed it and then collect their email address so that they can get a reward or something, then that's technically pseudonymized data because you, make, you have to be able to check whether they actually completed the survey. That means you're only allowed to simply share the first data set that in principle doesn't contain any identifiable data once you deleted the um, other data set makes it all pseudonymized and so personal data. Um, the GDPR only covers personal data. That's what the P stands for. Uh, so the other data that doesn't relate to a person is anonymous data. And that falls under intellectual property law because those are defined as facts. So data that are not about a person are just facts about the world. And facts about the world cannot be owned. We cannot own our conviction that the sun will come up tomorrow, which you could call a fact if you're optimistic or maybe not pessimistic. Um, so that's actually kind of solved as well. If data are not, if data are about a person, they belong to them. So you or your institution can't own those data. If they don't belong to a person, they can't be owned because they are defined as existing in the public domain. Um, that's only the case for facts. If people write a poem, that's a creative work and that's by default copyrighted. So if you have open questions or you do a qualitative study, arguably whatever is created is a creative work and copyrighted by the participant or by you to the degree that you also ask them questions. So that's a bit more complicated. That can still be covered, of course, if you want to share data, but it's a different story from the anonymization thing. Uh, James, just butt in if you want to add stuff. I just done. Okay, um, so in principle, you could just, once data are anonymized, share it and put it somewhere. But because it's so complicated to know when something is owned or not, it's generally a good idea to attach an explicit license. And by attaching the license, you can, for example, uh, make clear that you would like people to refer to you if they use the data. Um, there are a number of uh, licenses specifically created for uh, open data. They're at, uh, I think, datacommons.org. If you Google open data commons, or open data licenses, you can find these. We can also distribute the link afterwards. And they're quite simple licenses that basically say what you're allowed to do with the data. They sometimes say that if you um, use it, you also have to share your work publicly if you want to have a pay forward model. And it, the last one here explicitly lets you say, I don't need any rights. People don't need to cite me. They can just use this as their own. Um, most more data people, librarian people that I know of tend to argue that explicitly depositing stuff in the public domain is best because then it can be reused as much as possible and you prevent any potential future um, arguments. But of course, your, your mileage may differ. In addition, 
sometimes to make sense of data, you'll want to or have to also publish other stuff like questionnaires, stimuli, stuff like your procedures, stuff that allows people to actually understand what a specific column relates to. And those are not data. I mean, you could argue that everything's data, but they're not data in the sense that we're discussing now. Um, so those will be creative works, generally. So they could be copyrighted. And by default, if you don't actually explicitly apply a license, they are copyrighted by the creator, which depending on your agreement with your employer, could be your uh, employer. Um, luckily, most universities formally have an open science policy, which means that in principle, even if they hold the copyright, will want to make stuff publicly available with as permissive a license as possible. Um, so you can make this explicit by applying what are called the Creative Commons licenses, which are a set of licenses, kind of like a menu, that allow you to pick and mix specific uh, characteristics of how you would want people to be able to use the data or the questionnaire, for example. The simplest one is CC BY, Creative Commons Attribution, which basically means I made this questionnaire or letter to my participants or poem or whatever, and I want to publish it in a way that other people can just use it, copy it, whatever they want, as long as they attribute me. But you also have other models where you say they're not allowed to use it, use it commercially, or you say if they use it, they have to also license the product under, under an open license. So there are some different options and the, the, the Creative Commons license is super simple and understandable. So you can basically pick whatever works for you. And then it's not even enough to make stuff open. It should also be fair. And I mean, who can be opposed to fairness? And fair in the context of data means that it has to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And findable just means that people can find it, um, which basically means that if you put it on your website, that doesn't work. I mean, technically, of course, people could find it, but they'd first have to know what to look for. And sometimes, depending on how well your website is uh, indexed by search engines, they would even have to go to your website first to be able to find it. But there are also um, website systems that crawl the web and then make an index of open data sets. And there are existing repositories specifically dedicated to um, sharing data. So if you want to share data, putting it in one of those places makes it findable for others because they will use those resources to search for data, of course. OSF, the Open Science Framework, is one of these because obviously that's generally the framework people use for open science stuff. So that's where a lot of people will go to look for data. Dataverse is another big player in the open data uh, universe <laughs> where a lot of institutions have their own Dataverse universe or miniverse or whatever. Uh, it has, the data also has to be accessible, which means that ideally it's stored in a format on your disk that can be opened by anybody. Um, for example, SPSS files, .sav files, um, are technically, I think, not an open standard. It has been pretty much backwards engineered by now, pretty properly, so you can actually open it in Jamovi or R, but I'm not sure whether it's technically really an open standard. Other examples are Envivo and Atlas, which are proprietary packages for qualitative research. Their default file formats are also not interoperable. So that means it's, you can have your Envivo project file and put it on in Dataverse or on OSF, but it doesn't make it fair. It's findable, but people can't access it unless they have an, a license, which are generally expensive. So you would exclude a lot of researchers from actually participating in the scientific progress, um, scientific stuff. Just going to jump in. Like, I think you're right that the SPSS file format is proprietary, but it's interesting the extent to which it's actually almost quite a popular format for storing data in uh, because it has really rich metadata. Like, if you're used to using SPSS, you'll know, for example, that you can add labels to your scales. You can have like a short name and then sort of like a longer name, which is actually what the question was. Um, and so there are packages now in R, which actually like are really good at importing this. And so it actually, it seems very strange to be kind of like saying that actually like the SPSS file format is potentially quite a good one. Because I think the other thing about trying to GJ's point there about it being well documented is that you need to either have a data dictionary or use something like an SPSS file, which actually tells you like, does five mean strongly agree? Does five mean, what do these things mean? What were the questions? 
um, all of this kind of black documentation. And distressingly, the SPSS file format secretly does this quite well. Yeah, it might even do it so well that that actually prohibits the development of an open for a really open format that does this stuff. Because I haven't actually seen much. I mean, I'm not like you know scanning the internet as to look whether some people are working on this, but in the space and file types I encounter, I don't really see that. I mean, people do use SEF files, SPSS files, and that does seem to do the job. And it's hacked enough that it can be opened by open software. So um, for Atlas and Envivo, those, the big qualitative data uh, companies came together a while ago to create the Rotterdam exchange format or to become the Rotterdam exchange format initiative where they did create an open standard for qualitative data. So you are able to export to that format from Envivo and Atlas. But of course you have to think of this. Uh, and if you wouldn't be able to, you'd still be able to export your data to a set of PDFs or whatever. With qualitative data, also the concern is mostly the anonymization rather than the file format. Once you figure out the anonymization, the file format is usually solvable. We'll get to that uh, in a second. Interoperability is a bit more complicated and I'll get to that in a second as well. So I'll skip that over for now. And the reusability means that actually the data is not just accessible, but people can actually use it. Um, I said earlier that uh, facts are public domain and personal data are owned by the person. So as a researcher, if you collect data, you can't own it. It either belongs to the people that you collected the data from, if it's personal data, or their facts, and so they're in the public domain. I mean, it doesn't oblige you to make it public, but it also doesn't mean you own it. Um, it's possible to invoke something called database law, where you say, I went through a lot of hassle to collect this specific configuration of data, and therefore I have intellectual property over it. And that makes sense that we have this, because that allows us to have beautiful things like phone books, which is something that, well, James and me remember, and your parents will remember probably too. Um, so that otherwise there's no incentive for organizations to actually compile useful data sets. So you could invoke this in theory, and this would be an example of if you would invoke it, your data can no longer be fair, because it's not reusable, because you actually went through the hassle of making sure that nobody can use it. So that's why adding explicit licenses is very useful if you want to make stuff fair. Then we have the fun discussion about quant and qual. Um, sometimes in, in qual land, um, you hear the argument that qualitative data cannot be anonymized. But as soon as people start thinking about how to anonymize their quantitative data, they tend to take the same perspective that also anonymizing their quantitative data is very hard. Well, and I was almost about to say, and they're right, but it, it's not really hard. It's actually quite easy if you think about it in advance. When you think about uh, anonymization, as uh, James uh, mentioned when we were preparing, um, true anonymization is arguably almost impossible. Because if you have some data points and you would know 75% of the people in the world, then you could probably figure out uh, who the data uh, relates to. So anonymization is always a matter of degree. How much effort do you have to take to know who the data are about? And that's also how the GDPR defines it. GDPR says a data are identifiable if with reasonable effort you could find out about which person the data is. Um, one system used for this is k-anonymity. And k-anonymity means that you would need, for any number, what's the k again? Is that the number of cases or the number of variables? I forget. Do you remember, James? Cases. Okay. So then k-anonymity would be that for any combination of variables, you would have at least, so if you have two anonymity, you would have at least two rows that are not distinguishable for those, for those variables. And you can achieve this by increasing the granularity or decreasing the resolution of your variables. So if you have age and you measure it in, um, I mean, we never do that, but in theory, you could really measure date of birth, of course, or register date of birth. Um, that, of course, your data becomes much more identifiable than if you ask decades, like were you born in the 80s or in the 90s or in the 00s, for example. And you can do this after collection as well. So you can decrease the, well, the uh, resolution of your data. Another mechanism to increase the anonymity is to make sure you have a very wide sampling frame. That's something we struggle with anyway. But in theory, I know it's a wild idea, but in theory, you could also try to study people who are not first or second year psychology students. And that already really increases your sampling frame. On the other hand, James, maybe you want to share this cool example you had this uh, 
Yeah, so I've got a couple of examples here because while you could also be doing a project in, for example, a nursing home or a small situation, do you want to switch to the slides? Are they there? Well, I, maybe I forget which example I was going to share, but there's like so many examples. Yeah, we can uh, go to the, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this would be a thing which people would often do in a research methods class. You might run some kind of like survey, get your students to fill something out because it's always more interesting to like, you know, actually be analyzing data that somehow makes kind of sense to you. And if you're teaching undergraduate students and there's one student in your class who's a bit older or maybe they identify as non-binary or something, all of a sudden, just with that one kind of bit of information, even here, like, you know, it's not even like we have like a granular kind of age. It's not like we know that they're 27, but we know that there's somebody in the 26 to 30 and you can immediately pick that person out. Uh, next slide. Um, and the other one which cracks me up, partly because I helped design this survey, but also because I fill it out. Like there's probably like 4,000 staff in my university. Uh, and there's a question I think about nationality and there's a write in text box. And if I write New Zealander in that text box, Basically, I'm already identified across like those 4,000 people. So I think there's actually a lot of time thinking about like what's the kind of like the, the granularity, how can you, and it is like, you know, you don't need to be able to identify anybody. You just need to be starting to identify some people and especially to the extent that the, some, the one person or the two people that you can identify may be minority group members, then that becomes kind of like, particularly uh, sort of like worrisome. So I think when you're thinking about actually coming to sharing your own data, um, maybe working with a friend, working with somebody else, trying to go through and think about like, what is the data? How much of this do you need to release? And like, what things should you be more careful about releasing? Yeah. Do you want to leave the next example for later? And then I move back to the... Yeah. Okay. Um... Yes. Um, one thing to take into account here, and that's already, that's actually a bit, when I was raised as a psychologist, when I was studying, the idea was if you collect data, why not also measure this variable and this variable? Because who knows what you may find? That was clearly before the replication crisis and all the other crises that we are currently uh, struggling through. Um, but GDPR has this principle called data minimization, which means if you collect personal data, then collect as little as possible. If you uh, generalize that, that can solve, help solving these things as well. So really for everything, make sure you really have a good reason to, co to collect it and collect it in the lowest resolution possible. So basically when you, when you collect data, collect as little data as you can, <laughs> ironically. Um, I guess in your case, uh, James, you had plans for what you were going to do with the free text field, with the, whatever was typed. I didn't write that bit, and in hindsight, it was probably dumb to have that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, but that's kind of like a way to think about it, right? Because it's yeah. super tempting to think like, oh, but then, of course, we also want to know where the other people are from. But mm. um, that in this case, you could also think, well, they might be from, you know, very exotic places like New Zealand. So, mm -hmm. and there might be only one of them, like James. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have James in your sample, a lot of this is solved. But sometimes you do have James in it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I was just going to say, like, I mean, also, like, for people who are working with clinical populations, um, like, so I would have been involved with a little bit of work on people with cystic fibrosis in Ireland, and like, the entire number of people with cystic fibrosis in Ireland is really small. Um, and so, again, like, there can just be, like, groups where you're always going to hit. So this is about the sampling frame thing, that you're often dealing with, like, quite small sampling frames. Or it might be if you're working with a hospital or a, some sort of like patient population that they're local to you and that it can then become quite easy to identify single people. Yeah, and that also links kind of to qualitative data. With qualitative data, quite often you have a relatively small sample for sampling frame um, and people tell stuff about their life or about locations. So that means that anonymizing to the degree that it's well anonymous which arguably is what you do when you anonymize, um, can be quite hard. And of course you can replace places. Um, like when people say like, yeah, I was walking over the Queen Elizabeth bridge um, the other day and blah, blah, blah. Then you can say over the bridge or over the geographic reference. 
and this anonymization can also be in different resolutions, so to speak. So you can make it very hard to identify people, but also very hard to follow over anybody. Uh, and then you'll have to find some middle, uh, middle way. What we do when we use qualitative data is that we always go back to the participant and ask, do you think you're anonymized enough? Uh, because generally, if they think they're anonymized enough, arguably, they're, they're okay. Because we also say that we will make the data public, so they know what will happen. If they're comfortable with those things, it's fine. What we haven't yet resolved, come to think of it, only now, but still, that's possible. Um, I want to develop a procedure to make personal data public, because sometimes participants want that. Our privacy officer, of course, um, is not necessarily on board. It's possible to make personal data, as they call it, manifestly public. For example, um, the example, there's an article about this where people post the results of their DNA test on Twitter. And they discuss, oh, is this making it manifestly public and what are the legal implications? So there are processes for this. Um, but I can understand that privacy officers are not super enthusiastic to uh, explore that in depth because you don't necessarily want to be the first president that's been set. Um, but I do think we do have a responsibility here to facilitate that process for participants who do want their story told and who do want the world to know that it's their story. But I think there's still some work to be done. What you can also do is mask data. So in the, the reproducible open coding kit, an open qualitative software package that we're developing, you can do this by replacing all the characters, all the non-punctuation characters with a character like an X. And then you do retain the codes, so you still get information about code density, kind of about the, the cadence that people speak, but you, well, don't have the words, so you can't really uh, infer stuff. Do we have additions here as well, corrections, James, before we? Um, I was just thinking, actually, so a couple of years ago, I did uh, my master's thesis in teaching and learning or work, and so um, because I was getting people to talk about innovations in their teaching and learning, I thought that there might be people who would explicitly want to take credit for things. So we actually went through a consent process, which enabled people to choose between like not having their data shared, having their data shared, but anonymously or having data shared um, with their name attached to it. And so we did have some people who were quite happy to have their name attached to it. And then also there were some people who thought they were happy to have their name attached to it. And then we got partway through the questionnaire and there were some questions about how do you work with your colleagues who are, you know, like not so comfortable with like changing the curriculum? And they're like, oh, I don't know that I want this to be so publicly shared. So I think, it, I mean, it's even interesting. And that would have been in a context where I was mostly talking to people who would be quite strong proponents of open science who were suddenly like, ooh. Yeah. Very good example. So that just goes to show it's complicated. Um, sometimes your institution has a data sharing board, otherwise they might get one in the future. That's basically a dedicated body that if you have an incoming request for uh, data access, can judge it and make sure it's ethically in integrously handled. Of course, you, you don't use that for open anonymized data, but it's a way to actually share data that cannot be de-identified. Because, of course, we are still scientists. And the idea is that we can check each other's work and maybe look for biases and stuff. Um, so ideally, we have procedures on this. But not all institutions have those. What you can always do is enter into confidentiality agreements with people. Actually, James, do you have it? Because you, you said that we should add this. Do you have experience with this yourself? Um, so I have projects where we've got this approved, but I haven't actually had, I haven't got to the point yet where I've actually had to do a confidentiality agreement with someone. So that's like, I mean, I think it's a bridge that I'll have to cross soon. Like the um, the GPS example I have coming up would be like a clear example of that. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to this. Oh, uh, that's, this is important to remember though. The GDPR says that you can only process personal data temporarily. You have to tell people how you're going to process it. They have to be able to change the data, delete their data, etc. This also means that if you have a way to share data with others, you have to inform people of that as you collect it. So if you don't, you can't then later say, I create a data sharing board and other people can get these personal data because then you didn't inform people. You can of course always go back to people and then tell them if that's feasible. But so it's important to think these things through in advance. If you are sure you will not be able to anonymize data, and you feel that it's 
you know, a good thing to still make it possible for others to access it, then think this through. And, and of course, data stewards and privacy officers, I assume, love to think about these things with you. Otherwise, they should. Okay, I said earlier that I'd skip over the interoperability quickly because it's super complicated for us. Because unlike like um, bioinformatics, who actually have databases with proteins with unique identifiers, so they can have a data set where you can just have a column and you can know unequivocally what the column is about. We have constructs such as extraversion and impulse control, which are usually quite ill-defined. And then the columns don't even relate to the construct, but they relate to an item, for example, that's part of a questionnaire that supposedly measures the construct. So that all makes it a lot more complicated. Um, so what we need eventually to have unique identifiers for, for constructs and for items, and then the items should be described somewhere in a machine readable way, linking to the constructs unique identifiers that they're supposed to measure, because then it's possible to have a data set where for a column, you can actually retrieve the construct or a computer can retrieve the construct. And that would make data sets interoperable. You could have data sets from different labs and then by defining an umbrella construct that captures multiple different constructs, you can completely machine, a machine can actually understand the data and synthesize the data. So I'm kind of pushing two projects we're working on. One is operations.com, which is a repository for questionnaires and items with unique identifiers that then link to construct definitions, which are in the, the knowing what we're talking about paper, which I linked to there. So in case you're interested in this identifier bit, I realize that it's quite niche, most people aren't, but if you are interested, then there's more there. Uh, and these are the slides again, and now we get the cool GPS thing. Yeah, so one of our projects, we want to be able to share our GPS data. Um, and we want to be able to actually share it with, for example, uh, our city council in like quite granular detail because knowing where people stop, where people have like issues um, can actually help them design things from a city perspective. But because we have like really a lot of data about the people that we have and their travel patterns, then we need to kind of like be quite careful about how we go about anonymizing it. So I'm assuming that a few of you might be familiar with Strava. And so my example here is just of a Strava run. And so what Strava by default does is it cuts off the first, either 200 or 400, I actually forget which, but like the first segment of your GPS trace is its default setting. Um, but Strava, it turns out, um, is quite good at actually giving away your location. This is not as... Uh, Good as you'd like. So if GJ like whizzes his arrow around, you can see there's only about three three roads coming out of there, and basically the circle is offset from the centre. But if you can pretty much pick where the middle of the circle is a lot of the time from multiple Strava records, so you can actually usually pretty clearly, through quite fine detail, work out at where it is that somebody lives. So in our current project, what we've done to try and get around this is that we have a random offset from the true center so that you know that somebody's house is going to be somewhere in the middle of the circle, uh, but you don't know whereabouts it is because we used like a random seed to push that circle somewhere. And then if the person lives in a more rural area, then we obviously have to increase the radius of the circle because it could be that you live, yours is the only house that is under the circle. So that's obviously not going to be very effective there. Um, and this again would be one, so there's like a level of like more aggregated data, which will be really publicly shared because it's properly anonymous. And then I think like, I think we we feel like we have done a good job of this, but still a bit nervous about it. So this would be like uh, available on request after you sign a confidentiality, a confidentiality agreement um, to get access to the data, which only has their home location mask. Actually, I should say they're also allowed to um, uh, nominate other locations to mask if they want to. So it might be that they like quite frequently say visit a grandparent or some other location that they don't want. Um, wow. And done. do you um, do that automatically? Do they nominate in the software and does a script then anonymize or do does a person um, look at what should be anonymized? So we have like a, a not yet ready to release into the wild package, which will do the anonymization piece. Um, I think the other thing which I'm keen for that to do, though, is it also, like its end product, actually produces a graph 
not a, or like a, it produces like a thing like this so you can actually see whether you think the algorithm has done an effective job of anonymizing it so i think we don't just want to have like we want it to be done automatically but we also want to have like a human sense check to make sure that we we're confident that we've done like a good job of hiding their home location yeah very nice i realize now actually you have I also do some things in the artificial intelligence space and the ethical, legal, societal aspects of that. Um, one of the things that's big there is explainable AI. You know, the idea is you can't consent to artificial intelligence being used in your life in some way if you don't understand what it would do because then you can't consent to it. Um, this actually makes me realize that privacy and the kind of data that will be shared is quite similar. You have to mm. be able to explain to people what it would actually mean to share certain data before they can think about it and reason about it and which doesn't yeah. really simplify things but yeah so actually for this study so we have um a gps tracker on the e-bikes that we loan them but we also get them to download their google timeline data if they consent to it and so we also go into reasonable detail to try and explain to them what it is that they're actually downloading because i mean so we can show them the graphs and sort of like what you would see if you went into Google Maps and you can see what your trail is. But we then also like show them a snippet of the JSON code, which is not something that they probably ever want to know about. It's not something I personally particularly want to know about. Um, but just to be clear about like actually the like wild level of detail and strange information that Google often automatically discreetly leaks on you. Yeah, very good. That's actually almost like a, already an emancipatory, emancipatory side effect of the study. So that's pretty cool. Mm. So we thought we already said in the beginning where James said that if you have any questions, you can just ask them whenever you want. Clearly everything was crystal clear. Um, if you have any questions prompted by anything or some reflection on these things, as Rory said, you can throw them in the chat or unmute and throw them at us. Um, if there are no specific questions, James and me thought of something we could maybe discuss in the group, but Right. Thanks so much, guys. That's fantastic. I actually have a question um, just to kick things off. So my question is kind of on data cleaning, I guess. So if I want to upload my data file that is anonymized and has gone through all the checks to anonymize it as much as I can, um, I guess, is there a minimum amount of cleaning that you would kind of recommend to make sure that it is, I guess, reusable and interoperable? Um, and also kind of related to that, I guess, um, what kind of essential uh, metadata maybe would you kind of advise that I apply to that data set to make sure that it's, um, you know, findable as, as well? Um, so I guess the question kind of is around cleaning and applying metadata in a kind of general sense. Yeah. James, would you like to take this or should I? So, I mean, usually I think you would have done the cleaning before you like release the public data. And so, I don't know, GJ might disagree with me on this. So I would usually do all of that cleaning in a piece of code, which I would make the code available as long as the code wasn't like, because the, the other thing is like when you're doing some of this coding stuff, some of your code could actually, as you're like overwriting stuff, could include personal information. So you need to be a bit careful about that. But in general, what I would do is I would release uh, like a minimally cleaned data set but ha be clear about what the code was um, before that led to the outcome of that data set. Because I see, I definitely see a lot of people share, sharing open data and I look at the data and it's like so far processed that like I feel like most of the things which would be valuable to learn from it um, are long since gone. So for example, you often, I would say when I'm reviewing papers, I often see people where um, you don't see the original scale items. They've already computed the scale, but you don't know how they computed the scale. You can't go and run any further analyses to understand how the scale works because all of that happened kind of like beforehand. So I think that to me is like, that's too far processed. Um, and then obviously um, in the GPS stuff that I just mentioned, for example, um, you wouldn't want the GPS coordinates that you're hiding to be in the code that you're sharing with people because that it's the entire point, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, agree completely. I mean, I think ideally you share the rawest possible data plus all your scripts that you then apply and then also the data that it's in its final form, which you do the analysis on. 
Um, but I, when I work with people, what I usually do when I create a project, I first create a repository, Git repository it's called, and that's where I work. And that's synced to OSF. So from the moment I start something, usually before when I start thinking about something and I have a, an acronym, that's the name, then I create this repository. And from that point on, everything is public. Um, so for me, it's quite natural to have all these phases there as well, because that's just how I process the data. Um, and then I just make sure that the like private stuff is not synced to Git, obviously. Um, but a lot of people feel that there should be some quality check before they share something. And I think that's where you get the tension that James just alluded to, that people want to share data, but they don't want people to see how messy their house is, so to speak. Um, so they prefer to really clean it to a degree. And that's maybe also what your question referred to, Rory. So I think that there's no minimum cleanliness standard in my house, uh, my data sets. But um, I know that people do think, I, I think that what James said kind of sums it up. You want to, from an integrity, transparency point of view, see what happens. And if you really want to share only the last version, then sharing all the scripts that led to it, at least show exactly what happens to it. If you only share the last version, then there are many mistakes that you may have made in creating it that you, future you or others, will then not be able to spot. In terms of the minimum metadata, um, I'm kind of on the, I, I mean, I think if we want to take metadata seriously and interoperability, we do need these unique identifiers at some point, but we are very far away from that now. At the same time, we're still in a world where convincing people that sharing data makes the world a better place, that's still something we are doing. So for me personally, I'm like, if you already share something, that's awesome. And then the more scripts and the more versions of the data set you add, the better it becomes. I think if you start thinking about minimum data set, minimum metadata, uh, one of the intuitive things to think of is, for example, the age of the sample or something, stuff like that. That becomes complicated very quickly. Maybe not age, but things like gender identification, culture or geographic region or ethnicity, very many of those demographic variables are not really so simple. So I think it will be quite hard to define something super useful to us. And that's at least my thoughts. I may be too pessimistic. James may be more optimistic. Yeah, I mean, I think you definitely, like I covered off the idea that you need to be careful about sharing that demographic information. It's also like as somebody who now lives in a different country is really interesting that even questions like ethnicity and nationality are like really influenced by like local practices to how people um, ask them. Um, well, sorry, that actually gets back to, that's more a point on interoperability actually, that the way people ask ethnicity questions between countries is like usually wildly different and it would actually be really hard to harmonize it. Um, yeah. Like I think people mostly probably default to using whatever their census question is or something similar to their census question. That's a sort of a, a relatively common approach, but like there's no sort of like international standard for census questions um, on ethnicity. I think like in terms of minimum metadata, like if you're coming out of something like Qualtrics, actually I had like a, uh, uh, somebody else had a question in the chat. Um, if you're exporting out of Qualtrics, if you export it to SPSS, <laughs> um, and then you like open it in R, which you can do with the Haven package, then um, actually just copying down like the question codes and what the questions were and what the value labels are and pasting it into an Excel sheet gives you like a really good overview of what the variables are in your data set. And that's like, you know, actually a pretty good beginning for a data dictionary. Yeah. Brilliant, thanks so much. Are there any other questions if either you want to um, jump in using your mic or type it into the chat? Um, and in the meantime, maybe uh, I might just briefly plug, if you're feeling inspired by any of what we discussed today, there is a call open right now for special issues, uh, a special issue um, to health psychology and behavioral medicine uh, to do with registered reports um, and data notes. And um, Emma, our co-chair, has put um, the link for that special issue into the chat earlier. Um, and so that special issue is being managed by our, our co-chairs, Dr. Elaine Toomey and Dr. Emma Norris. Um, so if you're interested um, in uh, perhaps producing a registered report of your own, and that could be a, a future webinar um, that we organize um, as our next webinar, um, then the link is there in the chat. Um, I may also briefly, um, in case someone is typing a question, just put the link 
um, to our feedback form uh, for today into the chat. Um, so if there is anything, uh, whether that be registered report or otherwise, that you'd like us to organize a webinar on for our next webinar, um, then we'd be very grateful, um, as well as getting some feedback on how things went today for you. Um, if you could please uh, take a moment to fill out that form, um, that would be fantastic. All right. Um, I might stop the recording in case that is um, kind of impeding anyone from asking questions. Um, and I think we're good to stop the recording from my side anyways. <laughs>